the dwarf. Strong and sturdy infantry, strong missiles and artillery, supported by an unmatched stubbornness. In this video, I'll show every unit from the dwarf's roster and include their stats before and after research, XP and redline skills. I will also go over the lords and their specific abilities and skills that they gain. So as always in these type of videos, I'll show you the stats of the unit, of course, before and after research, XP and redline skills. This is for you to make better decisions in terms of what units you want to bring up up until the late game and that you have a basic idea of how they will become, precisely as pointed out here by the example with these Thunderers. So your army will consist mostly of great, sturdy and armored infantry, great missiles and artillery. You do only have average flying units, and you lack completely any cavalry, no typical magic as well. You rely instead on outlasting the enemy, with great leadership and armor throughout the roster. So in terms of any uh, army specifics, all Dwarven units have 35% spell resistance, making them much harder to defeat with spells overall, forcing the enemy of course to come forth and fight on your terms. We begin with Thorgrim Grudgebearer. A heavily armored and great melee lord, he has good melee attack, but even better melee defense, magical attacks, and a decent amount of weapon strength, including quite a lot of armor piercing, actually. Should be noted that he's classed as a large target, and with the lack of shields, he's kind of vulnerable to any missiles, even though with that armor he can survive, and that big book of him maybe can deflect some shots, who knows. Just don't call him short, really. Be careful, of course, when engaging any anti-large units. In campaign, you will have the Oath of Vendras, which affects an enemy with uh, minus 24 melee defense with a nice range too. You'll also have the High King passive ability, which gives uh, weapon damage and melee attack to allies in his range, with a good range too, 50 meters, it's decent actually. And then finally, we do have the Great Book of Grudges, giving melee attack to all allies in his range, also with a decent range of 55 meters, which is always excellent. So he's quite the good uh, supportive leader as well for his army. Ungrim Iron Fist. He is a great damage dealer. Ungrim has a lot of armor, no shield, but great melee attack and good melee defense. Uh, his weapon strength is also really good because he has armor piercing focused uh, damage and also a hefty bonus versus large. So he excels at taking out enemy lords or heroes on mounts or any other large target. He's also unbreakable since he is a slayer after all. For Ungrim's abilities, he has the Red Ruin, giving tons of weapon damage and armor piercing damage while reducing your melee defense by 24. Then you have Death Blow and all its variability. So the typical Death Blow is 18% damage and armor piercing damage when under 20% hit points. But then you have two alternatives to select from. The Determined Death Blow, 25% damage and armor piercing when under 50% hit points. And the Extremely Daring Death Blow, which is basically 50% damage and armor piercing as well as physical resist plus 30% but only when under 20% hit points so it's basically your choice. In addition he also can obtain the ability from his quest items the Axe of Dargo which is gives him 50% armor piercing damage and the nice amount of bonuses plus 32 so he's always going to be great against those uh, large targets. Belagar Ironhammer, armored, heavily armored, with a nice silver shield to deflect those missile attacks, with great melee attack and melee defense values, although not a lot of armor piercing damage, or damage at all. Uh, that is Belagar, he's better at surviving overall and outlasting his foes, so good lord, that does not fall down easily on a fight. So for his abilities, you have the mighty Oatstone, giving allies nearby melee defense and expert charge defense as well. Revenge Incarnate, increasing base weapon damage and melee attack by quite a decent amount, it's really cool. He also gains the Shattering Aura during siege battles, so basically they, it lowers the enemy leadership by 12 if they are in, the, in his vicinity, if they are wavering or lower. So basically it helps them shatter, it helps enemies shatter so that you know siege battles are much easier with uh, Belagar. 
And with his quests, he also gained the passive ability, the Hammer of Angrund, which uh, increases base and armor piercing damage, charge bonus, and melee attack if the leadership is above 50%. Grom Brindle, the White Dwarf, also heavily armored. You see the typical stance on these guys, always heavily armored. No shields, though. Grom Brindle excels in the offense with tremendous melee attack and magical weapons, but reduced melee defense, so he's much better at the offense than defense, of course. His weapon strength is also majorly armor piercing. Contrary to other dwarf lords, he actually has a decent charge bonus, so you should definitely ensure he gets that bonus while going to melee versus enemy single entities or infantry, which is his main use. For Grom Brindle's uh, abilities in campaign, he has the Grom Brindle has no fear, a passive ability and augment in an area, giving melee defense and allies unbreakable for 24 seconds. It's a great ability. Now, in terms of his other abilities, he can get the Rune Axe of Grom Brindle, which imbues his weapon with discourage, gives enemies hi a hit of minus 16 leadership, and giving him also plus 50% armor piercing weapon damage. And in addition, he also gets the ability from the Rune Helm of Zufbar, which is a leadership buff, plus 12, quite nice, to affect allies in range, of course, with a 35 meter range. Thoric Ironbro, more of a support lord, but still with decent armor and decent melee attack with magical attacks, but lower melee defense and armor piercing damage. His best use is stay on the back, using his rune magic and abilities, but he can engage against lighter foes. So, for his abilities, there's a lot of them, let's talk. The Master of the Ancient Lore, decreasing cooldowns by 5 seconds when in melee. Then we have the Locus of Power, which is granted by the Anvil of Dune, and then you get the Greater Locus of Power. This is an explosion with a good amount of armor piercing damage that affects enemy casters in range around him. So as long as any casting is attempted in 100 meters from Thorak, they'll get this explosion in them to them. Now, we also have the Master Rune of uh, Spite, which is a damage to all nearby enemies when in melee, and we also have a passive ability Master Rune of Grumgi, a passive missile resistance buff to allies in range. Uh, I also forgot about the Master Rune of Stronmead Redbeard. This affects only runesmiths by giving them a passive ability, an augment ability to uh, nearby units for their leadership and melee attack. Like other uh, runesmiths, he also gets the Forge Fire ability, so giving an nearby enemies minus 15 melee, m minus 15 armor, and the Rune of Hearth and Home, which gives Vigor per second and immunity to psychology to nearby allies. And even more runes, we have a, th a Rune Armor, so Thorax Rune Armor gives allies uh, armor and fire resistance, as you can see there, and then a nice ability from the weapon, which is the Clad Brakak. Uh, sorry if I mispronounce it. A bombardment spell, basically, causing major armor piercing damage to enemies and recharges when in melee. So, tons of abilities for Thorek himself. Your Lord. Basically, that's the name. A sturdy, reliable lord with great armor and actually a silver shield, which is his good point. He can survive well in combat, a good melee attack and much better melee defense, as well as decent weapon strength without too much armor piercing. He's best used against enemy single entities or infantry with some support. A caster lord for the dwarves with the rune magic, the rune lord, of course. He's still fairly decent in combat, with great armor values, and average melee attack and melee defense, not a lot of weapon strength, but he's still more reliable than other factions similar caster lords, though. He's great as a support lord due to the runes. So your rune lords can also get the passive ability Forge Fire, reducing enemy armor in range, for hex ability, area ability basically, and the rune of hearth and home, which gives uh, your allies uh, reduced uh, more vigor actually, and an immunity to psychology uh, whenever they are in range, which is always excellent of course. The Thane is a heavily armored uh, hero with a silver shield. He excels in single combat, good melee attack and melee defense values, and decent weapon strength. He's primarily used to help da take down enemy lords or heroes or single entities, or to even just support your troops. 
in campaign, Thanes will be able to get, if you wish, the Guardian passive ability, which is a physical resistance buff to all allies in range, specifically if they are lords or heroes. So great to act as bodyguards for them. The Runesmith, the sort of caster hero for the dwarves, he's still quite good in combat, tons of armor but no shield, good melee attack but rather poor melee defense, and in addition, uh, not a lot of weapon strength and not a lot of uh, armor piercing either. But still, he can engage in combat much better than other casters, which makes him quite resilient and useful. His main idea is, of course, to cast all the rune magic that he can obtain in combat. For the runesmith abilities, he can get the hardened armor, basically increasing armor to all units, or he can get the sharpened weapons, which is increasing weapon and missile weapon damage for all units. In addition, he also gets a couple of auras, the forge fire, affecting enemies in range for a minus 15 armor debuff, always useful of course, and then the rune of hearth and home, which is a passive ability giving allies for vigor increase and immunity to psychology, always effective as well. Your Master Engineer is quite a nice ranged hero with a ton of armor, but not a lot of melee attack or defense. He doesn't have a lot of weapon strength, but it is primarily armor piercing. His main use is, of course, with his good ranged attack, 180, quite nice, and he causes armor piercing missile damage as well as providing a lot of support to your ranged units, which is, of course, his main idea. In campaign, the Master Engineer has the restock ability, granting ammunition to a target. He also has the entrenchment, giving armor piercing missile damage and physical resistance, but cancelling all movement. He also has the Flash Bomb. This ability is a hex area ability, reduces speed and charge speed almost to a halt, really, 60%, it's really good, and minus um, 24 melee defense. In addition, he also has the Zuf Bar 42 Pounders. This is a wind spell like, with decent, uh, good uh, armor piercing damage, actually. Now, uh, one of the more favorite ones is Ballistics Calibration, which is an area uh, ability that gives uh, accuracy and re uh, reload skill to uh, your allied units. He's great to actually park near artillery, just because of this. And finally, he can also get, instead of that, the Cinder Blast Shell, which is a magic missile, three charges, causes fire damage and a good amount of it too, with some nice range. Gotrek, everyone's favorite dwarf. He's a powerful melee hero without any armor, with a ton of melee attack and good defense, as well as magical attacks. He also does quite a lot of armor piercing damage with the hefty bonuses versus large, so he's great at taking out anyone, especially any large targets. In terms of abilities, he does have, of course, the typical deadly onslaught and foe seeker, and you also have the rune axe of Gotrek, which causes dampen, removing magical attacks and spell resistance to enemies, and gives him 50% armor piercing weapon damage. Gotrek's Doom also gives him 40 melee defensive, 40% ward save, which is excellent for him to survive. This is how he survives. In addition, he also has a Heroic Fortitude, a passive ability regeneration with only one use. If his hit points are really low, less than 10%, he has the chance of gaining hit points. And if it wasn't enough, he also has Death Blow, giving him a lot of weapon damage and armor piercing weapon damage when his hit points are less than 20%. So overall, an excellent fighter for your front lines. And by the way, he does have tons of hit points as well, which also helps. Felix, a decent melee hero, more of a support one. He has decent armor, but no shield, a good melee attack and melee defense values, and he also causes armor piercing missile damage for the most part, and a bonuses versus infantry. So his main use uh, will be against other enemy infantry or small targets, of course. Now, in terms of abilities, he does have Helping Hand, uh, a buff that gives 40 melee attack and ward safe to any lord or hero in 50 meters around him. It is great to ensure that they both survive and do additional damages, of course. Now, Karag Ghoul gives him flaming attacks and more melee attack and even further bonuses versus infantry, making him really good at taking out enemy infantry, regardless of how strong they are. And finally, we do have the Blood Oath. This is his particular skill. He gives regeneration to up to two lords or heroes in range while he's in melee. Therefore, Felix is an amazing support hero for your other lords or heroes. 
Starting off with the Miners, a very low tier infantry, they do have the advantage of having Vanguard deployment and an armor piercing damage. So in essence, not a lot in terms of stats, good armor of course and good leadership, that's a staple for the Dwarves, but in the uh, end uh, game basically they won't become too much more than just a tier 1 uh, infantry, maybe tier 2 of course. Their main advantage is early game to ensure that you can get uh, someone that does armor piercing quite cheap. So yeah, that's their main use overall for your campaign. Then a variation of the miners, the miners with blasting charges. Same thing in terms of stats, but they do have that missile weapon. They do have this only one ammunition, of course. They will throw it to the nearest enemy, so be wary if you want to for them to, to target a specific target. It will cause a lot of damage. They do have that vanguard, so you can try to put them uh, on your flanks, for instance, to uh, try to mitigate uh, one specific unit. And yeah, that's the main usage of them. In the late game, they won't get too much better stats in terms of their range or anything like that. It's mostly just better in terms of uh, their melee as well. So for the most part this is an early game unit to try and get the most out specifically from that missile attack. And now to a regiment of renowned, the Ikrund Miners. Miners with Blessing Charges, uh, ROR. Much better unit overall because they do have, you know, enhanced stats overall on the board. And they have Frenzy, which gives them also immunity to psychology, which is also excellent. So the other advantage of them is that their missile strength is much more powerful, actually. Uh, and they do have three charges. So uh, this unit is much better at clearing up a, a specific enemy. So so just ensure that you bring them up with anyone that you want uh, to to get rid of very fast. So basically just put them against them, they'll use their ammunition and then they can finish them up with the armor piercing regardless if they have armor. So yeah, definitely a good addition to any army. Now to the Dwarf Warriors. So basically, uh, contrary to other tier 1 units, Dwarf Warriors are actually excellent throughout the game, really. They have tons of armor and the Silver Shield. Finally, this was updated, so now they have a Silver Shield blocking a lot of missile. They have a lot of leadership, not a lot of melee attacks, so they don't cause a lot of damage, but a good sturdy melee defense and a decent weapon strength, not a lot of uh, armor piercing there, but still fairly decent. They also have a charge defense versus large. Now, the idea here is that even in the late game, you can use these guys, definitely, especially for some budget uh, armies, they will do their best, especially in terms of holding down the front line. So it's one of the best ideas from the dwarves is that they actually can rely on these guys for quite some time. Of course you can upgrade them to other units, but they'll still do their job if what you want is just to hold the line. Now to another regiment of renown, the Warriors of Dragonfire Pass, Dwarf Warriors ROR. They do have flaming attacks, so they are good against those targets that have weakness, especially those that have uh, uh, regeneration abilities such as many units from the vampire counts or from the wood elves that's their main target in addition to that and to the increased stats they do have uh, bonuses versus infantry not a lot of it but still they'll be much better at taking out enemy infantry light infantry of course don't count on them taking out any armor targets really because they do have low armor piercing weapon damage still a nice addition throughout your the game of course they'll benefit from everything that you can g give to dwarf warriors later on and yeah uh, still a decent addition to your armies and the dwarf warriors with great weapons one of the initial early to mid game best units against any armor so of course their main usage is precisely that they do have that armor piercing damage they have decent stats although not a lot of melee attacks so perhaps some buffs are required remember they don't have a shield so they you need to cover them for any missile attacks and that's pretty much it. Now in the late game they do become much better at their, their job really up to tier 2 infantry so you can still use these guys in budget armies if you wish. Uh, definitely a good addition to any dwarf roster. Now to a much better front line, the long beards. Basically much better armor and still that silver shield, great leadership, decent melee attack but the best thing is their melee defense as well. They have a little bit more weapon strength than the dwarf warriors actually so they're a little bit better at clearing out uh, low tier units for sure. They still have that charge defense versus large so yeah definitely you can uh, withstand a, ch a cavalry charge with these guys. Uh, the advantage of course is that they are old grumblers. What 
that there's mean does that mean they give encourage a leadership bonus to nearby allies well, that's good that's good they also have an immunity to psychology which is always excellent these guys are meant just to stand and secure the front line uh, until you can you know send anyone else to de to defeat them now in the late game they get plenty of armor decent amount of melee attack and much more melee defense up to 70 so basically they'll just become a wall against your enemies they'll still do decent damage against enemy uh, low to mid tier units especially if they don't have any armor but don't count on them on defeating any chosen for instance and now a much better variation, the long beards of great weapons. So basically, the same thing as the Chaos Dwarf War is you have a, also a variation of the long beards with a great axe, so they can pierce through enemies, and precisely that's their main purpose. Uh, the armor piercing weapon damage that they have will certainly make short work of any enemies with armor. Still, they have a lot of armor, a lot of leadership, not a lot of melee attacks, so don't count on them hitting too much, but they still have decent melee defense, and they still have that encourage, they still have that immunity immunity to psychology so they can still be quite reliable uh, just ensure that they are not against any missiles of course because they lack the shield now late game you can still use and bring a lot of long beards with great weapons especially because their melee attack and melee defense and weapon strength are increased so definitely a good unit overall throughout into the late game as well because the dwarfs always have this advantage even their lower quality infantries or uh, tier 2 infantries can withstand punishment later on and now to a regiment of renown, the Grumbling God. Long beards, great weapons, regiment of renown. Still armored, still a lot of good stats, melee attack and melee defense. Of course, these are improved because they have unit rank 9, of course. Still that armor piercing damage, but the main idea here is that they have this passive ability, affecting allies in range, giving them vigor, so they will not tire as much, they'll continue to fight much better, and yeah, definitely a good addition to your front lines or to your back line to ensure that you can attack specific enemies with impunity and dish out tons of armor piercing damage. Now to one of the favorite units of all, the Slayers. They are basically uh, non-armor, but with a shield, I guess they use their axes to block uh, missile fire, which is always great. They are unbreakables, hence the 100 leadership that you see there. And contrary to other dwarf units, you do have a good melee attack and lower melee defense, so they're much better on the offensive. Now, their weapon strength, and this is the main use, they have a bonuses versus large, and still quite decent armor-piercing weapon damage, so they can go against those large large targets, those heroes and lords on mounts, or those single entities, or even cavalry, that's what you use them for. In addition, they are quite fast, so that's the main idea as well. This is your cavalry sort of, uh, of saying, because of course, typically dwarves are much slower. They have the death blow ability, which means that when their hit points are less than 20%, their weapon damage actually increases. So they're much better uh, when they are nearly dying, because they'll cause a lot more damage. In the late game, you can certainly bring Slayer units forever, really. Uh, they do get a somewhat of an armor increase, more speed, which is always excellent, more melee attack and melee defense, of course, but definitely tons of weapon strength. So they'll get much better to uh, destroy the enemies fast and ensuring that their weakness, of course, lack of armor, is not encumbered there. So yeah, definitely a great unit for any uh, dwarf roster. And now to a Regiment of Renown, the Dragon Black Slayers. Regiment of Renown of the Slayer unit. Basically the same thing in terms of armor. No armor, just a bronze shield because they block with the axes actually. Uh, they are still unbreakable. They do have better melee attack and melee defense stats of course. Still the same weapon strength with a good bonuses versus large. So their main idea is that they have a physical resistance and this ability. A passive ability. When they are in melee they'll imbue their attacks with flammable so the enemy will have a weakness to fire damage and their speed reduced by 30%. This is really great, especially they also get fire resistance plus 20%, so in essence a decent unit to use with anyone that has fire attacks because they'll also do a lot of damage. And if you still need a little bit more power fighting those large entities, let's go for the giant slayers. The difference of these guys, they don't have any shields, so they don't use those axes to deflect, even though it's quite a big axe actually. But they still are unbreakable, they still have that uh, death blow ability, so more damage when they are uh, under 20%. Uh, uh, health, and still decent amount of melee attack and not that much melee defense, these are more offensive units, but 
main difference. They gain armor, piercing weapon strength, and still quite a decent amount of bonuses versus large. So these are the guys that you send against any monster, anything at all really, they'll defeat it, they'll get rid of it. Especially in the late game as you can see there, where they get tons of more melee attack and weapon strength. So yeah, they become quite a menace. They also gain a, a nice charge bonus, so make sure that you charge them if the enemy is not charging against you, of course. But yeah, that's definitely a good addition to any dwarf roster if you have to deal with lots of large targets. Not one of my favorite units in the roster, the Hammerers, a damage dealing infantry. They have tons of armor, good amount of hit, uh, hit points actually. They have melee attacks, it's kind of a decent amount, but they also have magical attacks. So they're good against those that are, uh, they have a physical resistance such as demons, such as ethereal units, they will wreck them. In addition, they do have armor, piercing, weapon damage based, so yeah, these guys can do a a lot of damage, especially and particularly in the late game, they become such a threat. Look at that armor, look at that weapon damage, look at that uh, melee attack, and even the melee defense, and they still gain some physical resistance. Yeah, these guys will wreck through anything, even heroes and lords, if uh, you have some support for them, they'll get rid of them. So uh, definitely a great addition to any army, either early to, long, to uh, late game army, they'll do it. Now to a regiment of renown, the Peak Gate Guard, Hammerer's Regiment of Renown. The, the main difference, of course, with increased stats, they do have that magical attack, but they still have Sundered Armor. So they're great at diminishing the armor of opponents so that others can do more damage, or themselves, of course. Their armor, their weapon strength is still armor piercing, and an additional advantage is that they have the immunity to psychology. So definitely a great unit to have against those elite troops of the enemy in any army that you can put these guys they'll do the damage and finally we have the iron breakers heavily armored and shielded so they have a silver shield blocking 55 percent of all missiles which is great they don't have a lot of melee attack or weapon strength but they do have an amazing melee defense so it's really hard to take care of these guys to wreck them so that's their mainstay they're quite a, a powerful infantry unit a holding infantry whatever they're holding against they won't get through them now, they also have a missile attack, only two ammunition, but it doesn't cause a lot of uh, damage, but still, it's good to ensure that whoever is attacking them will always have a little bit less hit points when they are attacking them, so that's always nice. A nice notion is that they also have expert charge defense, so they negate the charge bonus of anything. Infantry, chariots, cavalry, whatever, just ensure that they are bracing and they'll negate the, the charge of them. Now, in the late game, of course, they become an amazing unit. They also get a lot more weapon strength and melee attacks, so they can kind of deal more damage, and especially that's important uh, in the late game. So don't count on them just as a front line, just as a, a unit to soak damage. They will also be able to do some damage, especially and particularly in the late game. And they get a ton of melee defense, so good luck for the enemy of trying to go through these guys. And then a regiment of renowned, the Norgrimlings Ironbreaker. It's quite a tongue twister there. So these are quite a front line holding infantry. Not a lot in terms of stats, of course, upgraded melee attack and melee defense. Look at that melee defense. Weapon strength is also not a lot of armor piercing, but still fairly decent, let's say. Now the missile strength is a little bit better in terms of damage, but still not a lot of armor piercing. So these are still a front line holding infantry, not a lot of uh, of damage to be done by them. However, they do have Vanguard deployment for whatever purpose you may have with the Vanguard deployment. Maybe you want them quite ahead of your army just to soak up some missiles just while your other, the rest of your army uh, in, tries to engage. Maybe that's the idea. They also have immune to psychology, which is excellent. But yeah, a nice uh, addition to your front line. Not a lot of damage to do, but definitely a lot of soaking uh, to do by these guys. 
Your first missile unit, the Rangers. They are Vanguard deployed, which is always excellent, and they also have stock, so they can move hidden in any terrain. That's their main difference from other ranged units. Basically, you'll be able to position them much better in flanks or anything else to ensure that their output of damage is done on the enemy's back, for instance, or flanks. Not a lot of armor, not a lot of, good, uh, of stats in terms of defending, of course. Uh, their range is basically the, the the good point and of course those abilities and the missile strength it does have a decent amount of armor piercing but nothing too shabby on so basically that's the idea for these ranger units now in the late game they'll also become quite significantly better especially in terms of their melee stats as well so they'll survive a little bit longer and their missile strength increases uh, exponentially really well as well as with the reload time and more ammunition so they'll just become more uh, better units overall to do that flanking business that stalking idea. That's how most of the, uh, the generalized use of this unit should be done, you know, to cause a surprise into the enemies to ensure that they are not prepared and of course you potentially get a little bit more damage from them. And for your more basic units, there will be the Quarrelers. Basically they are a decent melee combatant with not a lot of melee attack but decent melee defense, decent weapon strength, decent armor as well, which is why it's excellent, and they have a bronze shield, so okay, they can still survive even if they are going against any other enemy missiles, that is great for them. They have quite significantly good range and the missile strength is the same basically as the rangers, so decent armor piercing, not a lot of it, but still quite uh, excellent. So these guys should be the ones behind the lines of your front line doing some damage, focus firing large targets for instance, that's their main use uh, perhaps, but yeah, uh, a good uh, uh, unit for throughout the whole campaign, but of course really good in the beginning, in the early game. Now in the late game, they become a little bit better in many regards, so still surviving a little bit more with that higher leadership, higher armor, you know, and more weapon strength, but the best thing of course is their missile strength increased and reload time, so they're going to do a lot more damage faster, which is always great on any missile unit. And if you want a more hybrid unit, the Corollers with great weapons. The Corollers. Oof, I hate that word. So basically, they are differ from the previous ones because they have better stats. They lack the shield, but they have armor piercing weapon damage. So they'll be able to do some damage, at least to the enemies, while you are... Um, engaging of course and if they are you know if they happen to have to go into melee it's still fine for them it's still the same range ammunition and missile strength as the typical quarrelers so by all means you can use these guys if you're expecting the enemy to close up if they have too many uh, uh, melee units for instance fighting the vampire counts or something like that maybe you'll want to bring these guys because of course they like missiles the vampire counts like missiles so they'll be more keen to close up the gap and try to hit your melee your missile units and of course they can respond. Now in the late game of course they've become a little bit better in that melee uh, with more weapon strength, more melee attack and melee defense but as well in the ammunition, missile strength and reload time. So they're gonna get a lot of buffs for their ranged attack doing a little bit more damage and of course when the enemy hits they won't be as powerful. Maybe they can handle them. So a good addition to any dwarf army. Now to the rangers with great weapons. Basically they are close quarters infantry as it says on the card. Uh, their range is not as big, but their missile strength is actually armor piercing. And also their weapon strength is armor piercing. So here's the strategy, because they have vanguard deployment and stalk, here's the strategy with these guys. You vanguard deploy them into a location where they can close up with the enemy and hit them from behind with that armor piercing and then they can close the gap and finish them off. That's the main idea with these guys. Not a lot of armor, decent uh, melee attack and melee defense, but for the most part they're more of a ranged unit. So that's the main use for those rangers. Now in the late game they do get a little bit better of course with that speed, with that uh, melee defense and weapon strength so they can still do decent well in uh, uh, in close quarters but of course their ammunition, their missile strength, their reload time that's what gets better to the point they can get like probably two to three volleys even uh, before closing up the distance which is always great because it's a lot of damage done really fast. It's one of my favorite units in the roster as you can do some nasty uh, business with these guys, this, definitely of course. 
And now for a regiment of renown, the Ulthar's Raiders, Rangers with Great Weapons Regiments. So basically, the main difference, of course, other than better stats, is that they have this ability. They have a Hex ability affecting only one enemy. Good range, 150 meters, so well enough beyond their own range, giving the, that enemy less missile resistance, less missile block chance, and armor. So in essence, they can make an enemy really, really bad and poor at getting uh, shot at, so it's a good ability to have with other uh, ranged units as well, not just with, with them, of course, and that's one of the finest abilities for them to, to focus fire. Imagine focus firing a good single entity, a good lord, hero on mount, etc. It, they will bring them down really fast. And of course, in addition, there's still the good uh, armor piercing, both missile strength and weapon strength armor piercing, so they'll do just nicely as a good close quarters infantry, as it says on the title. Now for a more specialized missile infantry unit, the Iron Drakes. Tons of armor, not a lot in terms of melee attack or melee defense, but they can still hold their own for a while while you come in rescuing them, of course. Do note this ammunition is 25, I don't know what is what is happening here, what is 100, but it is a flaming attack. So this is basically a flamethrower infantry unit. Tons of missile strength, but basically it, it, they shoot a lot per volley, so they're going to do a lot of damage to any uh, enemy infantry units. That's basically Basically their idea here, but of course you can use them against any large targets, especially if they are vulnerable to flame. Now the uh, they do also apply the burnt. Uh, uh, debuff, which means that enemies will get minus 8 leadership, which is also nice. And of course, they have some fire resistance as well, uh, because of course they're handling these, this flamethrower, so they can resist their own flame as well. Now, in the late game, they become quite a unit. These are great units, anti infantry units, basically. Uh, they'll demolish anything that comes in contact with them. Look at that missile strength and reload time uh, upgraded. Uh, but of course, they also get more armor, more leadership, more melee defense and attack and weapon strength, so they'll be able to more reliably survive enemies that attack them while you go and clean them up, any any attacking units of course, and then they can continue to do their damage with the missiles. A strong unit, anti-infantry unit for your armies for sure. Now to a regiment of renown, the Skulker, Skulder Guards, sorry, Iron Drakes, R-O-R. So these guys are much tougher, basically, than the uh, original ones. They do have better melee attack and melee defense values. Uh, the difference here is that they no longer cause flaming ammunition. Actually, it, they shouldn't be called the flamethrower infantry, because what they do is actually an armor-piercing missile damage. That also has some decent explosive damage as well. So that's the main difference of them. They become a good... Uh, anti, uh, honestly, anti large targets, uh, still good anti infantry, but I'll use them as well as against anti large. And they have a, an ad advantage of having physical resistance 20%, as well as still that fire resistance 40%. So, definitely a good unit to have on any army. Of course, you can only have one, it's ROR, but definitely a good addition to your army. And now for uh, uh, one of the best units actually in the roster, the Thunderers. These are armor piercing missile units. Basically, that's their biggest strength. They do have a decent amount of range. They also have good armor and a bronze shield, so they can survive there. Uh, basically, always, always ensure that you have these guys uh, with line of sight. They're very good at focus firing anyone, really, and that's their main power, that they have armor piercing missile. Uh, the damage, so they are good to focusing down those armored targets. Now, in the late game, they become quite good, quite resilient, still powerful in combat, so they can survive a little bit, just, uh, you know, against light uh, opponents, of course, so the enemy will have to invest something else to deal with them, of course, and you can be more prepared. Uh, in terms of ammunition, they gain a lot of ammunition, gain a, a lot of missile strength, which is excellent, and reload time, so they'll do a lot more damage in the late game, uh, which is always excellent, of course, but they'll reliably become better over time uh, against any foe. Always good to have uh, four units of these guys. They can do with almost anything really well, especially if it was focus fire. Now to the Bugman's Rangers. They don't have a lot of armor, but they do have a bronze shield. Decent stats altogether, good melee attack and melee defense for a, a, basically for a missile unit. Of course, these are good. Not a lot of weapon strength, but still better than overall. Decent range, missile strength it doesn't have a lot of armor piercing, so it's kind of like the basic from the Corollers, for instance, or the other Rangers. But here comes the good part. 
They do have charge defense versus large, which is excellent for them to be positioned maybe on the flanks. They will survive the charge from any cavalry, of course, and they'll do some damage to it from afar. They have vanguard deployment as well. They do have stalk, so they can move hidden, and they have immunity to psychology, so no fear, no terror, no issues. To, in addition to that, they also have liquid fortification, so as long as they are not wavering, they will have heal. They can regenerate, which is really good for an archer unit. Now, in the late game, they can become quite good. Quite good, in fact. Uh, their melee defense and their armor, their leadership, it will make them a good tier 1.5, tier 2 infantry unit by themselves. But then, of course, they'll get even more missile strength, more missile damage, more reload time, less reload time, of course. So they'll become really good at uh, their ranged prowess, as well as their melee, so they can be quite a nice... Uh, um, a hybrid unit basically so it's a nice addition especially with that re with that regeneration of course you can always you know just get them out of combat they'll regenerate in slow uh, so basically that's the main idea that you can do with these bugman rangers always a good idea to have a couple of these units especially for your flanks that's how i, I, I like to use them and now to a variation of the Iron Drakes, the Troll Hammer Torpedoes. The difference with these guys is that they have an armor piercing anti large missile. That's a nice bonus versus large. So these guys are really good at taking down enemy monsters, enemy cavalry. That's the main deal with them. And they'll do it really fast as well. They also have the fire resistance of 40%, so they're better at resisting any flaming attacks, for instance. And of course, in the late game, they become much better versions. They'll survive a lot in combat, especially that high armor, they'll survive better than other missile troops, of course, so it's not like they're going to fight like an infantry unit, but at least it gives you some time, which is always essential, to catch up to them and help them out in need. Now, they also get a little bit more range, much better missile strength, and less reload time, so they become really good, quite a menace against any large entities. That's basically what I, I, I use them for. I always bring them alongside the other Iron Drakes, so one hits the infantry, and these guys handle anything that is large. Always a wonderful addition to your uh, forces. Now for one of the few flying units that you have, the gyrocopters. Basically tons of armor actually, which is kind of interesting. Lots of speed, but the melee defense is appalling. One of the lowest in the game. So never, ever, ever put these guys into melee combat unless you're really desperate. They still have decent weapon strength, but of course there's only four units here, so how much damage can they actually do? Their main usage is, of course, even though they have a low range, it's on their missile strength. So they can cause quite a nice uh, rate of damage, actually. They don't have a lot of accuracy, so these guys are quite useful, especially in the beginning or to the mid-game. You can also use these, mostly because they're flyers, so if the enemy doesn't have anything to do with flyers, well, then you have it. In addition, they do have a nice ability here with the gyrocopter bomb. Two uses of a powerful explosion, just a small strike area, but still decent uh, armor piercing damage, which is always nice. That's the main idea that you're going to be using these guys. Drop the bombs and finish them off with all the missiles. Just be careful never to engage them in melee. Now, in the late game, they become quite better at their ammunition missile strength. So, in general, they'll just be better off than in the beginning, especially with that range. They'll have a little bit more range, so they can go to toe uh, against any other enemy unit. Units, just as always, never against them against anything in melee. Now a better variation is the gyrocopters actually with the brimstone gun. Why? Because they do have a much better armor-piercing missile strength with the bonuses versus large. So these guys are really good at hunting down enemy large entities. They do have flaming ammunition as well, so if the entity has uh, regeneration, they'll do a little bit more damage. And this is more the niche usage for this unit. As always, as the other uh, gyrocopters, don't put them into combat because they'll die really easily, really fast. They also have the same gyrocopter bomb, so still you know, can pop those bombs up against infantry, for instance. It's a much better use for them. And then, of course, you can use that missile strength against enemy large entities. In the late game, like the previous one, they do get 
quite decent range. 120, that becomes much better. Missile strength is also much better. And the reload time reduces, so they'll do their damage much faster, implying that the large entity that they're shooting at, of course, will not be large for too long. <laughs> If instead you want something from the uh, the air that can deal out tons of damage to infantry, there we have it, the Gyro Bomber. A single entity, uh, good armor, decent speed, but of course appalling melee, melee defense. They should never, ever, ever, ever put them into combat. Even, even Felbats will do short work of the Gyro Bomber, so yeah. Uh, they have decent range, 125, and of course a nice missile strength. Of course it's only one entity, so it does need to, to have good uh, amount of damage there. Note that they also cause suppression, so they are good at diminishing the speed of enemies that may be one of the uses that you would like them for. Uh, you can also Vanguard, oh, you can also fire whilst moving with these guys, not Vanguard, sorry. And they do have gyrocopter bombs. They have 11 uses of this bomb. For the most part, this is what you use, you kind of carpet bomb, you know, you just go through a, a, an enemy infantry line and you bombard the hell out of them. That's a nice usage of the unit in itself, but of course, always count on that missile strength doing quite a good deal as well. In the late game they of course get much better missile strength ammunition and range which is always nice helping it out because you you have you need rely to that on red range to ensure that it doesn't take too much damage because of that poor melee defense but yeah overall a good unit to uh, focus on the enemy's uh, armored uh, infantry for instance. And now for a Regiment of Renown unit, the uh, Sky Hammer, Gyro Bomber Regiment of Renown. So they do have much better bombs, actually. They do have only five bombs, actually, instead of the 11, but much better range, much better strike area, actually, and damage. Which is always nice. These guys, w this guy will bombard the hell out of enemy infantry, but the same thing, don't put them into melee, whatever you do, just it's better not to do anything with it. It's best best to withdraw the unit other than the leaving it to die, really. Still a nice amount of missile strength and the same effect. It uh, causes suppression as well as, of course, it is mainly armor piercing, which is always nice. So yeah, a good unit to use against enemy elite infantry for sure. Uh, is especially useful if the enemy doesn't have anything to do with flyers, of course, but be wary of enemy flyers. Just make sure that you hunt them down with your own ranged units. With all of these gyrocopters and bombers, just make sure that you eliminate any threats to them in the skies, and then you can deal with them. For your first artillery unit, the Bolt Throwers. They are an anti-large and armor-piercing unit, so they're very good at wrecking those large targets, especially in the early to mid-game. Don't You'll have better versions, of course, of artillery for the late game, so this is mainly just useful for that early, of course, early to mid, especially because once you upgrade them, they do get uh, a little bit more range, more ammunition, more missile strength, and less reload time, of course, so they become a little bit better at their task of getting rid of enemy large entities, but they always lack a little bit of punch. They don't have a lot of damage, so it's more for the early to mid game. Coming up next, we have the Grudge Throwers. They are an anti-infantry uh, catapult, basically. They do have quite a nice missile strength, and, but the best thing is actually their range. They're able to actually hit accurately at wrong ranges. Now, in the late game, they'll become quite good because, of course, their ammunition, that missile strength gets increased, the reload time gets reduced almost to half, so they'll still be able to wreck those elite units, those infantry units, of course, that's their main target. If they are armor it's even better so that's the main usage that you will be using of these you can use these guys well into the late game without an issue and now to a regiment of renown unit the gob lobbers grudge throwers ror in essence they do have a goblin mangonel basically they throw a goblin prisoner <laughs> to a, on a boulder that's in fired so what it, that means is that it causes discourage any units of course hit by that goblin will think that could be me so that's the main idea uh, of course, 
not, uh, quite a lot of good missile strength uh, in itself, so the damage in itself is already good. Plus that minus 16 leadership, so that's really cool, and they still cause armor piercing. Same range as the others, just overall better stats in terms of, uh, of defensive capabilities. Not that you will put them in, in, in melee anywhere, anytime soon, but of course a good uh, addition to your artillery forces. Now to the cannons, basically a good anti-large unit, basically they don't have anti-large uh, damage, by the way, they only have armor piercing, which is always nice, but the main idea why it's stated on the card is because they're quite accurate, so these are good to take out enemy single entities on mounts, or of course monsters, uh, they're very good at enemy monster infantry, for instance, good at cavalry, of course, and especially in the late game you'll be able to use these quite well, because they do get better missile strength, much more ammunition, and reload time reduction, so they'll be very accurate, and they'll shoot way faster. So, a nice addition to your artillery units. Uh, I also always like to bring a couple of them to deal with the enemy lords or heroes on mounts. They're excellent at it, because they're so accurate. Now to a particularly deadly unit, the organ guns. Basically, these units, they'll wreck anything that they find. Why? Because they have sh four shots per volley, and all of those are mainly armor-piercing missile damage. So, uh, that's their main usage. You can use these guys against anything, really. They'll wreck them, especially if you have, like, two, three units. Just ensure that they have line of sight, because they will need it. Their range isn't as powerful as other artillery, so be wary of that. And especially in the late game, they don't gain any range, which is kind of sad, of course, They're, but... I guess it would make them overpowered. They already will do enough with their missile strength and with their less reduced reload time. So you're going to have a lot of damage per volley from these guys, definitely. Uh, you can use them against the cavalry. I love using them against enemy cavalry because they actually shoot quite fast. So they can uh, hit them really well. They have good accuracy against them, but always good against any type of target. Uh, any enemy uh, missile infantry, for instance, they'll wreck them, which is also a nice usage for them, but they can hit anything, really. Infantry, cavalry, monsters, single entities, whatever. Bring a couple of these guys for the late game and you'll see. And last but not least, the flame cannons. So this is a specialized field gun, anti-infantry, basically. They will hurl the fireball, basically. <laughs> it causes a lot of damage, not mainly armor piercing, so it does have some armor piercing, but it's mainly normal damage, so be wary of hit, trying to hit any, uh, you know, armored targets. They're very good at clearing up masses of enemies, really. They have that fire ammo, of course, and they also cause the burnt. So they're also just useful for that leadership debuff, uh, especially against uh, armies that don't have a lot of leadership, they're very useful, or especially against units that have regeneration. They'll always do really well. Now, in the late game, they also get a slightly an advantage because they do get a little bit more range, making them more useful, quite a lot of reload time reduction, and even more missile strength, implying that they'll do a lot of damage fast, which is always nice, especially for any artillery. You really want the, the reload time to be reduced as much as possible, and they'll shoot really fast. So, for enemy blobs of uh, low quality troops or low armored troops, they'll do so well. I always like to bring these guys along with the Thunderers, just for a little bit of fun, and uh, that debuff or the leadership is always nice to have as well. And there you go, all the units from the Dwarf roster before and after XP, Redline skills and research. I hope you guys enjoy this and it helps you build up your Dwarven armies in a better way to ensure that you always take the most of those units. And yeah, let me know in the comments below if you enjoyed this and I'll see you guys next time. Bye bye.